Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. How are you this morning? Doing well. News, Doing news, well. news. So we're going to check out things around the world today and see if they're any week. better than yesterday. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I noticed that the Democrats are squirming. I, I saw an interesting uh, talk about this by the Democrats. Well, we don't like our president. We have to get rid of him. And it's up to us because uh, Goldwater had to get rid of Nixon and go and you have to do it from the same party. Yeah. But uh, he's but he was the Democrat. He says he wasn't in office, but he was explaining. Well, the reason the Democrats aren't going to do it, they know they know about the vice president. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they're in a box. Yeah, we'll so talk I guess about you could that say later. When it comes to uh, sincere, uh, serious business of getting rid of a president, the Republicans are pretty good because they, they line up their ducks. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, uh, yeah. not, not that, uh, you, you know, Ford was a, a supporter of the free market and that sort of thing. <laughs> but anyway, they, they did it and they got rid of Nixon. But Nixon, you know, uh, I don't know why I'm talking about Nixon today. But, but he Nixon, was framed. <laughs> yeah, but Nixon, Nixon uh, probably didn't do as many bad things as some of our more current presidents. Would you think that might be the case? Yeah, I would think so for sure. <laughs> but anyway, he's gone, and uh, and uh, we we won't talk about him anymore except when we have something good to say. <laughs> we'll think up something. And one thing we could say, and that's sort of going to be in our talk, is he thought that trading with China was a better deal than fighting yeah. with China and bombing China. And it, we're back to where we are right now. If we have a bunch of people, uh, you know, look at, and we'll talk about that today, stirring up trouble. Sure. Why, why don't we have a, have a war with China? But before we get into that, I want to talk about, uh, at least mention, <clears throat> An interesting uh, thing going on here. This is. This sounds like the peoples are speaking. People are speaking out, uh, like they finally did with COVID. And here, this is uh, not in this country. Someday, maybe it'll be in this country and, and objecting to the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the the pr protesters in Prague. Uh, we're demonstrating tens of thousands. Yeah. I think I've done it once before against NATO and EU. Yeah. Boy, boy, I'll tell you what, maybe maybe they believe in uh, national sovereignty. Maybe they just believe in minding our own business and we don't have to have uh, have the have the deep state that runs NATO and a few other things telling them what to do. So to, that is to me very encouraging that uh, of course it was it was pragmatic and it was political and understandable but you know if you are uh, you know we we stand up for principles on free markets and all <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we sacrifice you know improvement because at the same time we can stand up for principle we believe we are going to improve the condition and uh, that, that is what uh, uh, they, they could be thinking. They may be thinking, yeah, I just don't want to freeze this winter. Yeah. And you're doing dumb things. And uh, pragmatically, uh, it's wrong. Uh, and, but in a utilitarian sense, uh, it's not, not worthwhile. So this was an opportunity to get some people together. You know, it's not easy to get tens of thousands of people unless they're annoyed. Yeah. And, uh, my argument is, why don't they get annoyed a little sooner yeah. <laughs> and uh, look into these matters before they get into trouble? Well, there is a lot of unrest brewing in Europe. It's not getting covered in the in the U.S. media for sure. The little bit that is getting covered in pro, you know, for the Prague protests, oh, they are far rightists and communists. They're those are the only people. And I think it's to discourage people from going down the street. But we can see here's a couple of tweets. This first one, if we can put it up, this will show. Uh, Tens of thousands, they said, the second anti-government protest in Prague this year. The protesters demand the government reverse its anti-Russian course and discontinue support for Ukraine. The first protest earlier this month drew some 70,000 people, according to the Prague police. Let's do the next one, because this is still Prague protests. Thousands of people gathered on Prague's Wenceslas Square to protest against the policies of the government on Wednesday. That's yesterday. The protest in Prague held under the motto of Chechia First, sounds familiar, is organized by a group who describe themselves as politically unaffiliated citizens. So the unrest is growing. 
the unrest in Germany is also growing. There are massive protests in Germany. And in fact, here's something. I think, I think the unrest in Europe uh, is, is evidence, is exhibit A in who may have blown up the pipeline. Because I think it's been sensed that there is a real problem here. There's a real strong call to open Nord Stream 2. Well, let's look at the next clip because this is Germany. We have some more in Germany. Thousands take to the streets of North Germany demanding a launch of Nord Stream 2. What's interesting about this, it was printed, it was published on 26 September, the day the pipeline was blown up. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Right. So it just seems to me like this unrest brewing, of course the U.S. would know it, whoever blew up the pipeline would know it. They knew that there's a prob possibly a wavering in support it's, it's getting thin, this alliance is getting thin. Okay, well, let's remove any possibility that we can back down off this. I do believe this is another good example that uh, sanctions aren't much of an answer. They very often e e can be equated to acts of war and sanctions. Sometimes they backfire. And uh, the very people whose governments are, are instituting these things, those are the people that are hurt. How often uh, will our government go around the world doing things to protect our national security and, uh, you, you, you know, our, our national I interests? Uh, but they, they don't uh, re realize that... Uh, that uh, this doesn't hold much water because, you know, I doubt very much if uh, the Czechs are going to blame Russia. Yeah. <laughs> like now, people come up. I, you know, when that first came up, you know, the first day this broke, we sort of poked fun at this. <laughs> Who's going to believe Russia would, would do this to their own pipeline? Yeah. Tens of but, billions of dollars. But, now, they, but they keep repeating it. Yeah. And somebody suggested, well, that's the, that's the way, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, an authoritarian government works. The more absurd it is, the more you say it, and the more the people will come to believing it. And uh, then if you have some allies in, in the media, it, it's very helpful. Uh, so <clears throat> and there's a lot of people in this country, in our country, who uh, are sort of pleased with blaming Russia for, for everything. Everything, they, yeah. they, they, <laughs> Bad so this weather. Is, this isn't hard for them to yeah. understand. Oh, yeah, they had an ulterior motive that maybe think that, well, I don't know. They may, but it's, it's hard to even figure out what would the ulterior motive be because yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Of course, to, <laughs> to ridicule the people who criticize Russia for everything does not equate supporting Russia. That's the problem. You know, every time we say this, they say, oh, you're just Putin's people, you know. <laughs> right. But here's, let's do a couple more of these Germany protests because I think Germany is in a way more significant than what's happening in Prague. Now here is, um, protests have begun against the energy policy of the authorities have begun in Germany. Thousands of Germans came to protest actions in the German city of Streusand, together with Mayor Alexander Badrow, writes NPR edition. Thousands of people out, and here's another one, the next one, in a, a town called, uh, let me see, Gera, Germany. Stunning scenes, thousands protest against the insane energy prices and demand an end to sanctions against Russia. And you can see they're holding a sign about Nord Stream 2. I think this is what spooked him. And in fact, let's put on that first video clip. This is of German protests. I think this is what spooked them, uh, particularly this, this clips like this. It's going to take a second to get it queued up. Very dramatic. Now listen to this. This is Germany. get the sense here of what's happening, Dr. Paul. This is in Germany. They are chanting Russia, Russia, Russia. Something was brewing, and I just suspect that this may have been the last straw, because now there's no chance of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It's blown up. So all of this is moot. All of these uh, demands that we open Nord Stream 2, it's off the table now. It will never happen. Boy, <clears throat> what, what, a, what a story, because it's so, so tragic that this thing gets turned around so quickly where where you know we we have the uh, end of the cold war <clears throat> we have a movement in trading and talking with people and traveling americans go go to russia but i see <clears throat> this week there's an announcement all americans better leave russia yeah D did i read that correctly yeah. you know get out of there because th things are brewing so which is very very tra tragic about this but <clears throat> yeah it is well the next story is a related story, so we'll go ahead and bring it up, and we can put on that next clip. And uh, 
both of these stories come by way of our friends at antiwar.com. And by the way, we do rely on them a lot, Dr. Paul. So, I mean, uh, obviously we want our viewers to support us, but antiwar.com definitely deserves their support as well. And I know they're trying to keep afloat, and it's important that they keep afloat. But this is UN Security Council to meet Friday on damage to Nord Stream gas pipelines. They're going to meet and try to figure out what happened. This is at the request of the Russians. And I watched an a, a interview uh, earlier this morning with Colonel Doug McGregor, a good friend of ours. And he seems to believe, he, 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 he discounts the idea that Russia blew its own pipeline up. <laughs> For the reasons that you said, tens of billions of dollars, they lost a half a billion dollars of gas. They could just turn off the, the, the spigot if they wanted to. Um, he thinks that Poland may have a hand in it, which I think is probably a good guess. And I always listen to what the colonel says. But the other thing about this, Dr. Paul, and John Lachlan, who's on our academic board, and in fact his uh, article is a lead article on ronpaulinstitute.org today, he makes a great point. You know, the Baltic Sea is known as the NATO Sea. Now, NATO is all around everywhere. They have a massive presence there. So even uh, if NATO didn't do it, if the U.S. and Poland didn't do it, how is it possible that the Russians sneaked into the NATO Sea, <laughs> went under, underground, and blew up a pipeline without being detected? I mean, it's almost worse for NATO if Russia did do it, because it shows they're totally useless. You can't detect a Russian sabotage attack right in the heart of the alliance. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that, that's too logical for anybody to catch hold of that and do it. But <clears throat> I'm not overly optimistic that... Uh, the, the UN uh, Security Council uh, is the answer. As a matter of fact, internationalism and globalism and all these uh, conspiracy people getting together uh, and wanting to run the world, they're the problem. Yeah. It's, it's, it, now, what we're, spo what we're spotting, each one of these, the, these crowds are, you know, the way the people are resisting against the cover, government, whether, and, and it wasn't just in our country, but when the people finally got uh, <clears throat> on to this silliness of the lockdown yeah. on uh, COVID, uh, you know, they were on, on the streets. So this is, uh, this is very good that they're doing this, but this is, this is the real government. It's not, it's not in Brussels, you know. Yeah. NATO's not going to do it. The United Nations is not going to solve it. Uh, even, even in the deep state that, that runs so much of what we, we put up with here, <clears throat> they're they're not they're, they're 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 the people who are opposing us. That's yeah. the, they're the ones who have the policies that uh, the American people and other people are getting disgusted with. But uh, you you talk about worldwide disorder. You, these these things. If it were only you know in one country, uh, yeah. they could lambast it. If it was only in one city in the United States or one city elsewhere, but this is this is getting pretty pervasive and uh, of course there are some countries that have uh, <clears throat> less freedom than we have and uh, even though uh, we are curtailed in our expression of what, what we believe in we can get canceled almost any time but uh, this is uh, uh, you, you know I think this is good that the people can still do this stand up and say enough is enough but they got to know what you're opposing is big government not your big local government your big government, your regional government, your NATOs, your United Nations, the Federal Reserve, all the way down. That's where the cause is coming from. Of course, I always argue it's a philosophic uh, problem, but this is also philosophic. People are simplifying and say, that may be fancy philosophy that you guys are talking about, <laughs> but our philosophy is we want to be left alone. Yeah. We don't want you doing policies that make us worse off, and we don't want you lying to us, Say, oh, we're going to make sure we're going to take care of you, you know, from cradle to grave. And you have people in the United States, believe it or not, I can't believe it, living in tents in New yeah. York City and San Francisco, and that's, uh, that's what's happening to America. Well, those tents are probably worth more than our houses, right, out in yeah. California. <laughs> <clears throat> well, speaking of the deep state, and you're right, I mean, I don't think we should be too optimistic that the U.N. Security Council is going to get to the bottom of this because they'll, they'll never agree on it. But speaking of the deep state, let's put this next one up. We talked about it before the show. Here's how we know that Russia definitely did not do it. Because John Brennan, the former CIA director, went on CNN and said, 
Russia is the most likely suspect in the Nord Stream <laughs> explosions. It's a signal to Europe that Russia can reach beyond Ukraine's borders. It won't take much if Russia decides to go after other pipelines, etc., etc. Okay, John Brennan, he's the author of the whole Russiagate lie. He is the person behind the <coughs> lie that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. He has been shown as a liar throughout the entire, you know, last five or six years. Everything that he said about Russia, everything he's accused Russia of doing, has been objectively shown to be a lie. The idea that he'd still have any credibility is, like in a, in a real country, he'd be laughed at. But no, he's still trotted out there. So that's like exhibit B for the fact that Russia couldn't have done it because Brennan decided that they did do it. So you're, you're following this legislative rule. You look at the title, and the title is exactly opposite what, what, exactly. They're, what, they're, what they're doing. So, uh, yes, I think this is... Uh, uh, so so true that they, they will mislead and they will lie. Now, uh, you might say, well, it's getting to be uh, simple. It's getting to be interesting on, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats and who are the best uh, for peace and who's the, who's the most aggressive for war. So you've got like Brennan. Uh, most of them are, <coughs> are bipartisan, but there's still a bunch of them in the Republican Party. Oh, yeah. So... Uh, even though the Republican Party, uh, some of the people who are closer to the people, the ones in the Congress, you know, the demonstration that we talked about yesterday, more of those individuals are standing up and they're willing to take a vote and say, you know, this It used to be when I f first went to Congress, if you had anything military or any dollar spent, we'd get six votes. Yeah, it's a little bit better than it was yeah. back then, mainly because we're broke. And the people are pinch, start, know they're pinching pennies, and they know it's not going to continue, and they'll take a hand out and fight for it, but they know this is not going to last. Yeah. And that's why there's, there's this scramble, you know, to, uh, to try to, well, you know, not only get their last pennies, but to try to get away from this stuff. Because, because it, it, the logic says that, it, you know, from the very beginning, uh, a lot of us just figured it was never going to work, but it takes time, you know, to really bankrupt a super, super wealthy, powerful country, and that is. But but we've been able to do it, and I think I think uh, I think all this stuff is a demonstration that we're a lot worse off than superficially a lot of people hope we are not <laughs> you know yeah. uh it, it, right now though they're becoming aware of it and uh, that's why i think the demonstrations in other words are good it's going to grow they're going to get bigger yeah well i know you don't want to take credit for it openly but i think the reason why those votes against that spending you know back 10 years ago or so why they kept increasing is because your person-to-person -person diplomacy in the thursday lunches etc like you say there was only a couple of votes against it and then people slowly felt like they could come out of their shell and that's because um you were such a subversive and you got them in your <laughs> office and, but massey is keeping that sense alive but he's in a way I, I feel sorry for him because he's more isolated there's no walter joneses there's no jimmy duncans around you know and, and no more reasonable progressive democrats yes yeah, that's gone they, yeah. they've just disappeared yeah that's you know. gone <clears throat> Well, speaking of our favorite progressive Democrat, Kamala Harris, <laughs> she was, she took a little trip. She went over to the demilitarized zone. She went to the funeral of the assassinated former uh, Japanese uh, prime minister. Uh, and she was, she was tough. Dr. Paul, she was tough. She's, she looks like she's made out of presidential material. She says the U.S. will operate undaunted and unafraid in the Taiwan Straits. Well, you know, there for a while we didn't know whether she, what she believed in or whatever, and she, uh, I mean, she she was really not the most popular person running for president last time. She and got immediately, three votes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and immediately they they put her second in line to become president of the world. Yeah. <laughs> it, it makes me say, but like I mentioned, you know, uh, the Democrats are in a bind. But if they're in a bind, the country's in a bind, uh, and and some of these things are are really, uh, you know, I, I see it, uh, I guess I'm too sympathetic or see this in a general sense because it's pathetic and it, it's sort of it's sort of sad and tragic what's going on. It makes you upset and angry at this, at what they're doing. But uh, <clears throat> when you look at, at what the president is, uh, is doing and now Kamala is, is, is uh, you know, 
that's why the Democrats are in a bind. They yeah. say, oh, I think we could get rid of the president. There's a sentiment there. But, you know, the unwritten rule is if you're really serious about getting rid of somebody, and this is why this, this uh, fanfare with the impeachment of Trump, that was just political theater. That was what it was. But when you have to get rid of somebody, uh, even if you're not the majority party, you have to have support from the party that, that the president belongs to. Uh, they have to support getting rid of them be, be, to get cre uh, credibility. But that's, that's where there's no credibility because they realize, uh, why, why, do you wanna, why would a Democrat want to get rid of uh, Biden? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Yeah. But uh, why can't you just accept uh, you know, the vice president? That's the way the law works. That's the Constitution. <laughs> well, there are some shortcomings there. The purity of perfect, uh, absolute democracy has never been advertised by the founders as being a solution to a political order. <laughs> yeah. well, the thing is that, okay, here she is. She's in Japan. Obviously, Japan and China are not best buddies by a long shot. But she's over there rattling sabers against China in Japan, talking about how we're unafraid to take Taiwan's side. The, the thing about this, Dr. Paul, is the timing and also the insanity of it. Because we saw at the recent Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit that China was not, not that it was necessarily wavering in its friendship with Russia, but there was a suggestion that it was getting slightly impatient about the situation and that it would hoped that it would come to a close sooner. There was just a sense that they were a little frustrated. So when you have that opening to diplomacy, to me at least, maybe I'm just an amateur, I am, but that would have been an open door for the U.S. to come in in a much more conciliatory tone. We understand that you're concerned and we want to mend the fence. Instead, they come in and just punch China in the face and it just seems like a, a, not a missed opportunity, but I mean, it seems like the only thing they understand how to do is just to beat people up, and it doesn't work that way. Well, maybe, maybe she's a little bit naive or something. <laughs> maybe she's naive and think, well, the third in line for the presidency went over and did this, and, you know, our president, uh, he doesn't say much about this, so I should go do it. And she's falling in the steps of number three, you know, Pelosi. Yeah. And uh, I understand that there was an episode in the last week that showed that uh, that trip uh, overseas and the, she and Pelosi still involved. I guess this is her last hurrah, you yeah. know. And uh, she's over there. It sh she got booed. Can you imagine that? You know, that's not polite. <laughs> Unless you're a bum. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it would maybe you know they'll get rid of Biden. Harris will come in. She'll name Hillary as her vice president, and then she'll resign. And then we'll all get the president we deserve. You're a conspiracy <laughs> guy. <laughs> Well, speaking of Kamala, we can't go by without, uh, as we wind down here, without mentioning this. Let's put on that next clip, uh, just to show the next, uh, there we go. This is from our friends at uh, Zero Hedge. Kamala Harris in high stakes gaff at the DMZ. Hails our strong alliance with the Republic of North Korea. And we even have a video of her saying this, and it's, you know, anyone can make mistakes. But this is kind of a big one when you're standing right between the two countries. Let's listen to Kamala here. So the United States shares a very important relationship, which is an alliance with the Republic of North Korea. And it is an alliance that is strong and so enduring. You just, it's, it, anyone can make a gaffe. We all make gaffes. But you just get the sense that she really doesn't know the difference between the two countries. Well, somebody was, was uh, one of the broadcasters said, you know, anybody can do it. And they were sort of <clears throat> giving her a little bit of a pass. But then they also ended and say, yes, but the vice president of the United States, you know, you and I can do that, you know, in conversation and, and, you know, have a slip of the tongue. But when you're the vice president of the United States talking in a serious manner, yeah. you shouldn't be making those kind of mistakes. I know. Is that clip still playing in the background? I, I think I hear it still playing. You can turn that off, please. Um, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's not a good look, whatever the case. You need to have some confidence uh, in the vice president, particularly when the president seems to be teetering on the precipice <laughs> at every turn. So anyway, I'm going to close it out, Dr. Paul, first of all, with an announcement. And this is a, a fun thing that we're looking forward to. If we can put on that next clip. We are, the Ron Paul Liberty Report and Ron Paul are on Locals now. Our partnership with Rumble is going very well. I got a nice note from the fellows at oh, Rumble yesterday. Good congratulating us on our, a couple of really upticks in our show.
They've been very supportive. And uh, Locals is an integral part of Rumble. Rumble owns Locals. And Locals is kind of, again, like a backstage pass. It's like the, um, uh, the get together with friends. Get to, it's like what we have at our conferences where people get together. So Ron Paul is on Locals, ronpaul.locals.com. You can join for free. Uh, you can join for a small fee and get exclusive material. We're just getting started, so we're just starting to put some stuff up there, but we've got a lot of ideas about we're, what we're going to do. I'll put a link in there, so go ahead and, and get started just by signing up for free uh, to get a feel of what's going to happen. And finally, as this is my last show this week, I cannot go without saying, next one, I've got to huck some... I've got to be a huckster here and, and, and get some tickets sold. Ron Paul Institute Conference, Lake Jackson, Texas, November 5th. Cancel culture, the war on speech. As you say, Dr. Paul, the First Amendment is the most important. Without that, none of the other ones make any sense. Well, you know, I always have to caution myself because when I go to our conferences and uh, groups, uh, and I'll be going to one with the Mises Institute, groups like this in YAL, and, and I'm visiting with like-minded people, you, you come back and you think, you know, things aren't so bad. And I like that because it's upbeating and I get some benefit from that. But the whole thing is, is, you know, sometimes uh, the reflections that we get and the comments we get from supporters and the enthusiasm we get, we got to be cautious. We have to still be realistic. We can't, we can't deceive ourselves because there's some days I wake up and I see some of these numbers because I've, I've over the years, you know, the numbers... Uh, weren't that important to me. The, the message is what I concentrated on. So that was uh, something that I, you, you know, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't worry about. But now some of these numbers come back and uh, they, they sort of get my attention and uh, I'm very pleased about it. But uh, I, I put it up to the fact that there are so many people now, the numbers are growing, people who are willing to spread a message. I do believe that good messages are spread by word of mouth eventually, and the people have to stand up, and the attitude of the people really have a lot to do with it. But the, the purpose and the, day and the requirement of individuals to step forward and and make a statement like we saw during the uh, COVID episodes where a parent or somebody would stand for, I've had enough, and they got some coverage. So that is what's necessary. And it's out there. As bad as things are, uh, I, I think the opposition that we're talking about, you know, the, the progressive era, uh, the last hundred years of the destruction of our educational system, it's on its last legs, just as the monetary system, it's on its last legs. But what we better be doing is preparing in the best manner possible our side of the argument and what it should be replaced by. And that, of course, uh, for, for me, is replacing it with a concept of individual liberty. And uh, that will solve so many of our problems. I can't solve them all because I think the founders are also correct that, yes, the Constitution is very important and it's a good way, a good set of rules and laws to follow, but it won't be worth much if uh, the morality of the people is not such where they will support liberty and assume the responsibility. And, of course, uh, so we have two jobs. One, the message, and the other is to get people to, you know, get old-fashioned and understand the dis differences uh, be be between a higher law and becoming a nihilist and say, well, you can't know anything, so we can do anything we want. Uh, that has to change, and I think it is in a, in, a, in a way changing right now. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.